I'm going to start this morning a brand new series, Nailed It. I don't know if the phrase, I'm sure we've probably heard it, shame on you. Shame on you. We felt the sting of those words. At times, we might have experienced them verbally, someone saying it literally to us. At other times, probably more often than not, those words are words that we have sensed. We've perceived them. We've assumed that that person uh, with a look that they're saying it, actions, looks, Shame on you. Shame is a powerful force. I'm reminded of Nathaniel Hawthorne's classic work published in 1850, The Scarlet Letter. It's a moving story of shame and guilt. The basic storyline applicable 150 plus years after it was first written. Shame causes us to feel like we're not worthy. Not worthy of God's love, not worthy of God's acceptance, not worthy of God's plan for our lives. Makes us feel that we are damaged beyond repair. Adam and Eve in the garden modeled for us in those beginning pages of Scripture when in response to their sin, they act in ways that illustrate shame and guilt. In that beginning beginning of time in the garden, in that perfection of the garden, it's described of them, this is before sin, that they were naked but yet felt no shame. Again, that was prior to their sin, in the perfection of the garden. And then as sin entered the world, as they chose that, they chose to disobey God's command, and and sin as it came into their lives, so did shame, and it took root driving them to hide from God, to sow fig leaves together, to try to hide themselves from him, hide themselves from each other. Their choices, their sin, producing shame. And like them, shame drives us. It drives us to separate ourselves from God. It builds walls between us and God. But not only between us and God, but us and who we really are and us and the people around us. Shame destroys Shame is powerful. Several weeks ago at the end of a worship service, many of you were here, we had a cross right here in this space. And we invited you to write things down that you wanted to nail to a cross, issues, struggles that you might have to nail to a cross, to take to the cross. And as I mentioned last week, we, the campus pastors, we took those cards off the cross and we categorized them and just tried to find some common themes. And the most often of all the cards that were on there, the, the thing that we found in the, 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 the common theme, and there were different variations on that theme, but the common theme, most common, was the idea of the struggle that we have with guilt and shame. And so today, let's begin with the end in mind, because we want, just like we tried that day, to nail it to the cross, but we want to give you some, some help in doing that. So we want to nail it once and for all, guilt and shame, to a cross by God's grace, by the, by the help, of, with the help of the Holy Spirit and by the power of the resurrection, for you to find, for us to find today victory over this thing that, that if, we, if we aren't careful can, can begin to shape us and define who we are. Now, as we think about guilt and shame, sometimes we use those words interchangeably, but there is a difference. So, let's begin by trying to understand. So guilt, guilt's tied to the sense that I did something wrong. I feel guilty because of of something. In other words, guilt is that feeling of remorse or responsibility when we believe that we've done something wrong or we failed to do something that we should have done. And so hopefully guilt is is something in us that motivates us toward repentance, motivates us to to get help, to, to confess that before the Lord and to to find grace and forgiveness for it. Shame, on the other hand, is that feeling of embarrassment or humiliation that arrives when we feel like we failed to live up of what someone else's expectation of us is. It's, it's different. It's that, it's that struggle to, as we think about how people perceive us. It's related to the sense that we feel judged or feel rejected by others. So shame is something that can become very unhealthy. It it, it conjures up these feelings of a negative self-image, of feelings of worthlessness. So as we often like to do, let's put the cookies on the bottom shelf, and Daniel DeWitt can help us here with a little simple uh, way to define guilt, shame, and the difference. Guilt 
is usually tied to an event. I did something bad. Shame is tied to a person. I am bad. So those definitions in mind, and, and basically guilt is something that God can use. Shame is something that, that is the enemy tries to use to debilitate us in our relationship with God and to keep us from God. So let's jump in and we're going to look a little survey of Scripture as we look at some classic examples in Scripture of guilt and shame. And then we're going to find today the victory, the victory that God's grace can bring us in our guilt for our shame. Let's begin at the very beginning. I mentioned Adam and Eve. And Adam and Eve, the, uh, in Genesis, the very beginning in the garden, prior to sin, in that perfect state of the garden, it says in Genesis chapter 22, or two, chapter 2, verse 25, and the man and his wife were both naked, or as my wife would say, naked, and were not ashamed. She's from Tennessee, if you didn't know that. So, in the garden... There they are, and there was, as Scripture defines, no shame. Nothing was coming between them and God. Nothing was coming between them. They're in perfect relationship with God, perfect relationship with each other, and then sin entered, bringing into that relationship, both with, with them and with God, shame and guilt. Causes them to hide, to hide from God, to put barriers between themselves and him. And we see that same pattern of guilt and shame and its impact through Scripture. We were, for the last several weeks, on a journey through Holy Week. And we looked at times at the life of Peter. And if we just jump back to something that we talked about last week, the moment that when, when Jesus is about to be taken to the cross, Jesus had told Peter that you will deny me three times before the rooster crows. And when Peter denies him for that third time, we see it recorded in Scripture in Luke 22, verse 61. And the Lord turned in that moment... And looked at Peter. And Peter remembered the saying of the Lord, how he had said to him, Before the rooster crows uh, today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and he wept bitterly. Peter seems to not only be experiencing guilt for what he's done, and we don't know for sure because we can't it doesn't say it necessarily, but we can just infer potentially that what he was also experiencing in that moment was shame. Not only did I do something bad, but I am bad. Scripture says that he weeps, that he, that he runs, that he goes, and he's feeling guilty, and he should feel guilt. He did something wrong. He is guilty. He denied Jesus. Guilt can be, again, a good thing that pushes us to repentance, pushes us to confession, pushes us to deal with our sin. As we looked like last week, we, we talked about what Jesus wanted to make sure was communicated. And this was after his resurrection. So he's been crucified. He's resurrected. And this was the message he wanted communicated to the disciples, Mark 16. But go tell his disciples... And Peter, that he's going before you to Galilee, there you will see him just as he told you. So make sure, the angel says, make sure you tell Peter. Make sure you get Peter. Make sure Peter goes to Galilee. I want to see Peter. The last time that, that Jesus and Peter locked eyes was when he had, for that third time, denied him. And in that moment, he remembered what Jesus had said to him. He remembered that Jesus had said that you'll deny me three times. And Peter said, oh, no, there's no way. I'll, I'll stand with you. I'll die for you. And he felt guilt as Jesus looked at him. And now Jesus, knowing that Peter needed to experience confession and repentance and restoration, he wanted to make sure that, that he would have a chance to sit across from Peter and look him in the eye and give him a different look. To give him a look that reminded him that he loves him, that he forgives him, that he wants to restore him. Some of you have been in your relationship with Christ, imagining that look, not as a look of grace or forgiveness, but a different look. And I just want to encourage you to imagine that Jesus has brought you here, wanted you here today, so that you could see from him his view of you, that he loves you, that he wants his grace to extend to you. He, he died for you. He wants to be in relationship with you. He wants to restore you no matter what you've done 
to, to, to free you of the shame that you have felt that didn't want you to experience, to free you from the guilt that you have experienced, which has been a good thing. And so today, I pray that you would, would find the, the hope and the restoration that Peter finds. I love how Peter, after he has this encounter with Jesus there in Galilee, after the resurrection, how Peter, who, 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 who didn't think that he was, would, could ever be restored, that, that Jesus restores him. And we know of Peter that it was on the day of Pentecost that it was Peter who stands and preaches the message and thousands come to Christ. It was Peter who was the, who was the leader of the New Testament church there at the beginning, uh, there in Jerusalem, and was a key figure in the spread of the gospel. His restoration complete. Another picture that we have of this idea of guilt and shame, we see it in Peter. We see his restoration. We see how it moved him to find, to find that help. But then there's another picture, not so positive. And we look at Judas, that same time period where Peter denies Jesus, Judas denies Jesus, Judas betrays Jesus, sells him out to the Jewish religious establishment. And as a result of selling him out and, and getting those 30 pieces of silver as payment for, for betraying Jesus, Judas then begins to feel guilt, shame. Matthew 27 records it, verse 3. And then when Judas, his betrayer, saw that G Jesus was condemned, he changed his mind. And he brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priest and the elders saying, I've sinned by betraying innocent blood. And they said, what's that to us? See to it yourself. And throwing down the pieces of silver into the temple, he departed and he went and hanged himself. Jesus is feeling guilty. And again, we can infer that he's also feeling shame. He has this deep conviction like Peter that he's done wrong and he had done wrong. Guilt, again, is a good thing. And so Judas moves, understanding that he's done something wrong. He says it in verse 4. I've sinned and I've betrayed innocent blood. He names his sin. And so he goes back to those Jewish leaders that had given him the 30 pieces of silver. And he's trying to make, make it right in, in, in some way. And so he give, wants to give them back the 30 pieces of silver. But what he gets fuels his shame, reinforces it. We don't care. We're not going to take your money. That, that's blood money. That's, that's worthless to us. We're done with you. We don't care what you're, you're trying to make amends. What's that to us? See to it yourself, they said. And with their, those words, he feels the sting of rejection. And would, in what is arguably some of the saddest words in all of Scripture, Judas throws down those 30 pieces of silver, it says. He departs, and then here's the line, some of the saddest words in all of Scripture, and he went out and hanged himself. Judas had devoted years of his life to Jesus. He's followed him. He's believed in him. He's, he's watched him do, do mirac miraculous things, and in this moment, he's, he, he's broken around what he's done and yet, instead of his guilt moving him to repentance and restoration, shame takes root. Satan's words producing in him the sense that you, not only have you done bad, you are bad. And Judas chooses shame over forgiveness, and he takes his life. The Old Testament, we have a classic example in David. David, his story, as many of us know, is a classic story of sin and shame and guilt, the story of his sin with Bathsheba. I want you to listen as I read Psalm 32. David describe his guilt and, again, what we can infer as shame so powerfully. In Psalm 32, verse 1, blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and whose spirit there is no deceit. For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy on, upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I confess my transgression to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. So we see David describing what was going on in him as he, as he was 
just walking with his shame and his guilt. It was eating him up. He had stuffed it down. And we know that he had stuffed it down. He had not dealt with it for months. He had, he had lusted after Bathsheba. He acts on that lust. He commits adultery. She gets pregnant. Uh, he tries to cover it up. That doesn't work. So he ultimately has Uriah, Bathsheba's husband, murdered. And then he takes her as his wife. The child is born. He tries to act like there's nothing going on. That it's, it's all okay. But we see him describing what's going on inside of him that no one else saw. And maybe you're here today and everything looks good on the outside. But you could, could use some of those same descriptors that David used of your own life with your unconfessed sin and how it's eating you up. And so this child, again, is born, and David is, is just kind of going through the motions, and then God finally sends Nathan when the time was right to confront David in his sin. And in that moment, we see again this descriptor. Let me read the first couple of verses translated, the New Living Translation, David's words in Psalm 32. Oh, what joy for those whose disobedience is forgiven, whose sin is put out of sight. Yes, what joy for those whose record the Lord has cleared of guilt, whose lives are lived in complete honesty. Do you hear the freedom that he experiences when he confesses his sin, when, when he allows the grace of God to be poured into his life? And so that was what he experienced. The joy that when that disobedience is forgiven, it's what Peter experienced when he was restored and he goes on to do these wonderful things for God, for his Savior, as he lives out his faith. On the other hand, we have Judas, who believed the lies of Satan, that not only did you do bad, but you are bad. You're beyond the ability to be reconciled. John 10.10 10 talks about the lies of our adversary. The thief only comes to steal and to kill and destroy. I come that you may have life and have it abundantly. And that's, that's our adversary. He would love to twist guilt into something perverted. Guilt, which can be a good thing that moves us toward God. It moves us toward repentance and grace and love and forgiveness. Instead, he would love to manipulate that guilt into shame. So not only, again, did you do bad, but you are bad. And that's the strategy of our enemy that kills and destroys. But God, God pours mercy and grace into David's life when he confesses. We see that confession in, in some of the most beautiful words in, in Scripture. In Psalm 51, powerful, and as, as David pours his heart out. It's a, it's a prayer of confession before God. Powerful words. Let me, let's, let's read it. And sometimes we just skip over the, 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 the title of the Psalms that sometimes are at the top of the Psalms. Don't skip over the context for this Psalm. This is what it says. A Psalm of David when Nathan the prophet went to him after he had gone into Bathsheba. So after he had sinned with Bathsheba, after he'd covered it up, after he'd suppressed his guilt and shame, after, after he had done those things, after he had acted like nothing had happened, after the, he, he had married Bathsheba, after he'd had the child, after months had passed, then Nathan confronts David at just the right moment, and that confrontation leads to repentance. And we have David's words recorded here in Scripture. Listen to his prayer. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgression. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. And I want you to notice, David doesn't deny his sin. He doesn't minimize his sin. He doesn't shift blame away from his sin. He doesn't try to sweep his sin under the rug. He acknowledges the stain of sin that he cannot deal with. I can't forgive myself. Absolutely <laughs> None of us can fix our sin on our own, and that's what he acknowledges. And he asks God to help. Will you wash me? Will you cleanse me? Can you take away what I can't fix on my own? It's the picture of a man standing before a judge saying, I'm guilty, but would you have mercy? Knowing he's guilty, but God have mercy. For I know, he goes on, I know my transgression. My sin is ever before me. It's the rebel acknowledging the rebellious heart. 
My sin is ever before me. I carry it, he says, like a weight around. And of course, we don't know exactly what's going on. Is it just guilt? Is it guilt and shame? We don't know. Again, we can infer that there's both. Now, not only did I do bad, but I am bad, but, but God is coming in. The, the remedy for both guilt and shame is the same. It's God's grace. That's great news. God's grace is the remedy for both. He says, against you, David writes, against you, praise, have, uh, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Again, he's admitting his sin. And that's important that we acknowledge, because we've all sinned. We acknowledge that we violated God's law. And it seems odd, I know, to, for him to say against you, God, and you only have I sinned. I mean, Uriah the Hittite, who he murdered, would probably have a little bit of a disagreement if they were to talk. But what he's talking about is he's talking to the one that he'd sinned against, God, the holy judge. And, 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 and God is the one that he needs to confess to. God is the one that he needs to seek repentance. The God is the, the judge that can deal with his sin. And so he throws himself onto the mercy of a just God, acknowledging and dealing with his guilt as he goes to God with it. Behold, he goes on in verse 5, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth and in the inward being. You teach me wisdom in the secret heart. And so he's acknowledging this sin nature, this sin nature that we have all, all of us have it. We've all inherited it. We all have this bent towards sin that we, we can't fix on our own unless, unless God draws us to himself. We are broken. Purge me, he says, with hyssop. And I shall be clean. Wash me and I'll be whiter than snow. Again, he's acknowledging, God, I, I need your help. I need you to, to, to forgive me. I need you to cleanse me. You're the only one that can do it completely. You're the only one. And when you forgive me, when you handle my sin, then, he says, I'll be whiter than snow, pure. Purity of forgiveness applied to my life. Let me hear let me hear joy and, and gladness. Let the bones that you've broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sin and blot out my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence. Take me, take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore, and I love these words, the, his prayer. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. Again, what? What David is describing for us, what he's praying to God, he's describing the blessing of confession, the blessing of dealing with our guilt and shame. And when we deal with it, when we give it to the Lord and we accept his grace, his love in exchange for our sin, in exchange for our guilt and shame, what he replaces it with is joy and gladness. We can experience this as he describes a clean heart, a clean slate, a renewed spirit, a right spirit. And I love, again, verse 12, that we can experience the restoration of the joy of his salvation in our lives. So let's conclude and take a few minutes and look and, and just understand the steps that we need to apply to nail our guilt and shame to the cross. The first thing we see as we've looked at these scriptures, that we need to confess and repent. Just like David we don't need to brush it aside. We don't need to act like it's a thing. Our culture would say, no harm, no foul, just as long as you didn't hurt anybody, whatever. Our culture is going to tell us one thing. Scripture is clear. We need to confess it. To acknowledge our sin, to confess it, to repent. And a good way to think about repentance is just to this visual of I'm just turning around. I'm, gonna, I'm going a different direction. This isn't I'm sorry I got caught. It's not that moment. We've all experienced that moment. I'm sorry I got caught and we feel something about getting caught. No, this is, God, I'm sorry that I've sinned against you. And I'm going to change. I'm going to repent with your help. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us of our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So I'm confessing, I'm taking responsibility, and I'm turning from that, and I'm trusting God, and I'm accepting his grace. And then... And that's what we need to do. We need to accept God's forgiveness. 
Again, as we're nailing our guilt and shame to the cross, I accept his forgiveness. The forgiveness that's offered me through the finished work of Jesus on the cross. He paid for my sin. I'm trusting in the power of the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross, trusting that he has taken the record of my sin, like we read in Colossians multiple times the last few, few weeks, and he's nailing it, that record, to the cross. And so I experience, I accept God's forgiveness. Ephesians 1, 7, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. Grace, again, the remedy both for our guilt and for our shame. I confess, I accept the grace of God. It's nothing that I've done, but I accept, God, what your son has done for me, your grace. And that's the next thing, that we focus on his grace. Instead of focusing on the guilt, instead of focusing on the shame, instead of focusing on what I may feel from other people or sense from other people of what they think and, and how disappointed they are or whatever other people or what our culture or whatever feels about us or says about us or, or whatever. No, I, I, I embrace the forgiveness. I embrace the grace of God. As 2 Corinthians 12, 9, he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of all my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. So it's us acknowledging God's all-sufficient grace that I can find freedom from my guilt, the guilt of my sin. I can find freedom as I recognize, you know what? I'm a child of God, that God loves me, that God's forgiven me, that he's inviting me to be a part of his family that I'm a son or a daughter of God, and if I'm a son or a daughter of God, then I have worth. We're forgiven. God loves us. God values us. And just the realization, as Paul wrote, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. And so let's nail today our guilt and shame to the cross and understand that by God's grace, we can find freedom. And then finally, I nail my guilt and shame to the cross as I discover, it helps me as I discover the blessings of community. There's no better way to, to really get it inside of us that we've been forgiven, that we've been set free than in a body of believers, that in the family of God, that we can remind each other that we are forgiven, that we have been set free, that God's grace is amazing, and we can sing about that, and we can celebrate it in a place like this. We need each other. God's created us for community. Reminded of the letter to the Hebrews in chapter 10, verse 24. And let us consider how to stir one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. God's wired us for community. We are better together, better connected. And so as we in the body confess together and repent together, renounce shame and, and, and accept the forgiveness from our guilt, and together we can remind one another of God's love for us as the day of his return approaches. And so, yes, as our worship team comes back up, we've all sinned. We've all blown it. We all have this sin nature in us that needs to be dealt, dealt with. We all uh, have experienced as a result of our sin, and it's a good thing, guilt. It's the recognition that we've, we've done wrong. We've done bad things, but shame is not what God wants for us. Shame that whispers that you are bad, that you are beyond help. God wants to free us from both today. And as we said, the recipe, the, the cure is the same, God's grace. So I don't know what you came in with. I don't know what the feelings of guilt or shame that others, or maybe you've even just been putting on yourself. But my prayer is that you get, you're set free today. That you sense God's love today. That you sense God's grace today. And we remind you again of David's words in Psalm 22. And my prayer is that these words would be your words today. Oh, what joy for those whose disobedience is forgiven, whose sin is put out of sight. Yes, what joy for those whose record the Lord has cleared of guilt and whose lives are lived in complete honesty.
So today, let's nail our sin, nail our guilt, nail our shame to the cross, and experiencing, as David describes here, as it has been cleared, as we have been cleared of guilt, may we experience the joy that's restored to us of his salvation for us. Today, I want to pray for us. I'm going to use the the words of the psalmist in Psalm 51 to articulate our prayer for us. But I would just ask, ask us all to stand. And I want to voice this prayer on, on our behalf. And so is there something today that you need to confess? Is there some shame that you need to just be free of today that you need to nail to the cross? I don't know what it is. You know. God knows. And that's all that matters. And so as I pray this prayer, you, you let these words be your prayer to free you from the shame and guilt that Satan would want you to continue to be in bondage to. And so, Father, today have mercy on us. According to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions that I confess to you today. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin, for I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin my, did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being. And you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me today, God, with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me from my sin, and I'll be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you've broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sin and blot out my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. But today, God, we pray as we confess to you, restore to me, to us, the joy of our salvation, your salvation, and uphold me with your willing spirit. And we pray that in the powerful name of our Savior as we nail our guilt and shame and we trade it for the forgiveness and the grace and the mercy of you, our loving Father, because of the finished work of Jesus, our Savior, on the cross. And we pray it in his name. Amen.